So I'm going to read a book called Seed Folks. And it's a book about a community and a garden. Um, and I'm going to break it up into a number of different recordings and with, you know, a few chapters on each recording. Um, this is a book that I started with the sixth graders and we made it about halfway through. Um, but I'm just going to start from the beginning so that anybody else who wants to follow along can. So, seed folks. No place for a garden. An icy wind teetered trash cans and turned my cheeks to marble. In Vietnam, we had no weather like that. Here in Cleveland, people call it spring. I walked half a block, then crossed the street and reached the vacant lot. I stood tall and scouted. I'd never entered the lot before, or wanted to. I did so now, picking my way between tires and trash bags. I nearly stepped on two rats gnawing and froze. Then I told myself that I must show my bravery. I continued farther and chose a spot far from the sidewalk and hidden from view by a rusty refrigerator. I had to keep my project safe. This chapter is called Kim. I stood before our family altar. It was dawn. No one else in the apartment was awake. I stared at my father's photograph, his thin face stern, lips lashed tight, his eyes peering permanently to the right. I was nine years old and still hoped that perhaps his eyes might move, might notice me. The candles and the incense sticks lit the day before to mark his death anniversary had burned out. The rice and meat offered him were gone. After the evening feast, past midnight, I'd been wakened by my mother's crying. My, older, my oldest sister had joined in. My own tears had then come as well, but for a different reason. I turned from the altar, tiptoed to the kitchen, and quietly drew a spoon from a drawer. I filled my lunch thermos with water and reached into our jar of dried lima beans. Then I walked outside to the street. The sidewalk was completely empty. It was Sunday, early in April. An icy wind teetered trash cans and turned my cheeks to marble. In Vietnam, we had no weather like that. Here in Cleveland, people called it spring. I walked half a block, then crossed the street and reached the vacant lot. I stood tall and scouted. No one was sleeping on the old couch in the middle. I'd never entered the lot before or wanted to. I did so now, picking my way between tires and trash bags. I nearly stepped on two rats, gnawing and froze. Then I told myself that I must show my bravery. I continued farther and chose a spot far from the sidewalk and hidden from view by a rusty refrigerator. I had to keep my project safe. I took out my spoon and began to dig. The snow had melted, but the ground was hard. After much work, I finished one hole, then a second, then a third. I thought about how my mother and sisters remembered my father, how they knew his face from every angle and held in their fingers the feel of his hands. I had no such memories to cry over. I'd been born eight months after he died. Worse, we had no, he had no memories of me. When his spirit hovered over our altar, did he even know who I was? I dug six holes. All his life in Vietnam, my father had been a farmer. Here, our apartment house had no yard, but in that vacant lot, he would see me. He would watch my beans break the ground and spread, and would notice with pleasure their pods growing plump. He would see my patience and my hard work. I would show him that I could raise plants as he had. I would show him that I was his daughter. My class had sprouted lima beans in paper cups the year before. I now placed a bean in each of the holes. I covered them up, pressing the soil down firmly with my fingertips. I opened my thermos and watered them all. And I vowed to myself that those beans would thrive. The next chapter is called Anna. I do love to sit and look out the window. Why do I need TV when I have 48 apartment windows to watch across the vacant lot and a sliver of Lake Erie? 
I've seen history out this window so much. I was four when we moved here in 1919. The fruit sellers' carts and coal wagons were pulled down the street by horses back then. I used to stand just here and watch the coal brought up by the handsome lad from Groza, the village my parents were born in. Gibb Street was mainly Romanians back then. It was adio, goodbye, in all the shops when you left. Then the Romanians started leaving. They weren't the first or the last. This has always been a working class neighborhood. It's like a cheap hotel. You stay until you've got enough money to leave. A lot of Slovaks and Italians moved in next. Then Negro families in the Depression. Gibbs Street became the line between the blacks and the whites, like a border between countries. I watched it happen through this very window. I lived over in Cleveland Heights for 18 years, then I moved back in and to take care of my parents. That border moved too. Most all the whites left. Then the steel mills and factories closed and everybody left like rats. Buildings abandoned, men with no work, drinking from nine to five instead, down there in the lot. Always the sirens, people killing each other. Now I see families from Mexico and Cambodia in countries I don't know. Twelve people sometimes in one apartment. New languages in the shops and on the street. These new people leave when they can like the others. I'm the only one staying. It's so. Staying and staring out this window. This spring I looked out and saw something strange. Down in the lot, a little black-haired girl hiding behind that frig refrigerator. She was working at the dirt and looking around suspiciously all the time. Then I realized she was burying something. I never had children of my own, but I've seen enough in that lot to know she was mixed up in something she shouldn't be. And after 20 years typing for the parole department, I just about knew what she'd buried. Drugs, most likely, or money, or a gun. The next moment, she disappeared like a rabbit. I thought of calling up the police. Then I saw her there the next morning, and I decided I'd solve this case myself. We had a long spell of rain then. I didn't set eyes on her once. Then the weather turned warm, and I saw her twice more, always in the morning, on her way to school. She was crouched down with her back to me, so I couldn't see just what she was doing. My curiosity was like a fever inside of me. Then one morning, she was there glancing about, and she looked straight up at this window. I pulled my head back behind the curtain. I wasn't sure if she'd seen me. If she had, she wouldn't leave her treasure buried long. Then I knew I'd have to dig it up before she did. I waited an hour after she left. Then I took an old butter knife and my, my cane, and I hobbled down all three flights of stairs. I worked my way through that awful jungle of junk, and finally came to her spot. I stooped down. It was wet there and easy digging. I hacked and dug, but didn't find anything except for a large white bean. I tried a new spot and found another, then a third. Then the truth of it slapped me full in the face. I said to myself, what have you done? Two beans had roots. I knew I'd done them, done them harm. I felt like I'd read through her secret diary and had ripped out a page without meaning to. I laid those beans right back in the ground as gently as sleeping babies. Then I patted the soil as smooth as could be. The next morning she was back. I peeked around the curtain. She didn't look up here or give any sign that she noticed something wrong. I could, I could see her clearly this time. She reached a hand into her school bag. Then she pulled out a jar, unscrewed the lid, and poured out water onto the ground. That afternoon I bought some binoculars. The next chapter is called Wendell. My phone doesn't ring much, which suits me fine. That's how I got the news about our boy, shot dead like a dog in the street. And the word last year about my wife's car wreck. I can't hear a phone and not jerk inside. When Anna called, I was still, still asleep. Phone calls that wake me up are the worst. 
Get up here quick, she says. I live on the ground floor and watch out for her a little. We're the only white people left in the building. I ran up the stairs. I could tell it was serious. I prayed I wouldn't find her dead. When I got there, she looked perfectly fine. She dragged me over to the window. Look down there, she says. They're dying. What? I yelled back. The plants, she says. I was mad. She gave me some binoculars and told me all about the Chinese girl. I found the plants and got them in focus. There were four of them in a row, still little. They were wilted. Leaves flopped flat on the ground. What are they? she asked. Some kind of beans. I grew up on a little farm in Kentucky. But she planted them way too early. She's lucky those seeds even came up. But they did, said Anna, and it's up to us to save them. It was a weekend in May and hot. You'd have thought those beans were hers. They needed water, especially in that heat. She said the girl hadn't come in four days. Sick, probably, or gone out of town. Anna had twisted her ankle and couldn't manage the stairs. She pointed to a pitcher. Fill that up and soak them good. Quick now. School janitors take too much bossing all week to listen to an extra helping on the weekend. I stared at her one long moment, then took my time about filling the pitcher. I walked down the stairs and into the lot and found the girl's plants. You don't plant beans till the weather's hot. Then I saw what had kept her seeds from freezing. The refrigerator in front of them had bounced the sunlight back on the soil, heating it up like an oven. I bent down and gave the dirt a feel. It was hard packed and light colored. I studied the plants, leaves shaped like spades in a deck of cards, definitely beans. I scraped up a ring of dirt around the first plant to hold the water in any rain that fell. I picked up the pitcher and poured the water slowly. Then I heard something move and spun around. The girl was there, stone still ten feet away, holding her own water jar. She hadn't seen me behind the refrigerator. She looked afraid for her life. Maybe she thought I'd jump up and grab her. I gave her a smile and showed her that I was just giving her plants some water. This made her eyes go even bigger. I stood up slowly and backed away. I smiled again. She watched me leave. We never spoke one word. I walked back there that evening and checked on the beans. They picked themselves up and were looking fine. I saw that she'd made a circle of dirt around the other three plants. Out of nowhere, the words from the Bible came into my head, and a little child shall lead them. I didn't know why at first, then I did. There's plenty about my life I can't change. Can't bring the dead back to life on this earth. Can't make the world loving and kind. Can't change myself into a millionaire. But a patch of ground in this trashy lot, I can change that. Can change it big. Better to put my time into that than moaning about, the, moaning about the other all day. That little grammar school girl showed me that. The lot had buildings on three sides. I walked around and picked myself out a spot that wouldn't be shaded too much. I dragged the garbage off to the side and tossed out the biggest pieces of broken glass. I looked over my plot, squatted down, and fingered the soil a while. That Monday, I brought a shovel home from work. All right, I'm going to read one more chapter and then wrap this, uh, this video up. The next one is called Gonzalo. The older you are, the younger you get when you move to the United States. They don't teach you that equation in school. Big Brain, Mr. Smoltz, my 8th grade math teacher, hasn't even heard of it. It's not in Gateway to Algebra, it's Garcia's equation. I'm the Garcia. Two years after my father and I moved here from Guatemala, I could speak English. I learned it on the playground and watching lots of TV. Don't believe what people say, cartoons make you smart. But my father, he worked all day in a kitchen with Mexicans and Salvadorans. His English was worse than a kindergartner's. He would only buy food at the bodega down the block. Outside of there, he lowered his eyes and tried to get by on mumbles and smiles. 
He didn't want strangers to hear his mistakes. So he used me to make phone calls and to talk to the landlady and to buy things in stores where you had to use English. He got younger. I got older. Then my younger brothers and mother and Tio Juan, her uncle, came north and joined us. Tio Juan was the oldest man in his pueblo. But here he became a little baby. He'd been a farmer, but here he couldn't work. He couldn't sit out in the plaza and talk. There aren't any plazas here. And if you sit out in public, some gang driving by might use you for target practice. He couldn't understand TV, so he wandered around the apartment all day, in and out of rooms, talking to himself just like a kid in diapers. One morning he wandered outside and down the street. My mother practically fainted. He doesn't speak Spanish, just an Indian language. I finally found him standing in front of the beauty parlor, staring through the glass at a woman with a dryer over her head. He must have wondered what weird planet he'd moved to. I led him home, holding his hand, the way you would with a three-year-old. Since then, I'm supposed to babysit him after school. One afternoon, I was watching TV, getting smart on the Brady Bunch. Suddenly, I looked up. He was gone. I checked the halls on all five floors of the apartment house. I ran to the street. He wasn't in the bodega or the pawn shop. I called his name, imagining my mother's face when she found out he'd fallen through a manhole or been run over. I turned the corner looking for the white straw hat that he always wore. Two, blo two blocks down, I spotted it. I flew down the sidewalk and found him standing in front of a vacant lot, making gestures to a man with a shovel. I took his hand, but he pulled me through the trash and into the lot. I recognized the man with the shovel. He was the janitor at my old school. He had a little garden planted. Different shades of green leaves were coming up in rows. Tio Juan was smiling and trying to tell him something. The man couldn't understand him and finally went back to digging. I turned Tio Juan around and led him home alone. And led him home. That night, he told my mother all about it. She was the only one who could understand him. When she got home from work the next day, she asked me to take him back there. I did. He studied the sun, then the soil. He felt it, then smelled it, then actually tasted it. He chose a spot not too far from the sidewalk, where my mother changed buses. She'd gone into a store and bought him a trowel and four packets of seeds. I cleared the trash. He turned the soil. I wished we were farther from the street, and I was praying that none of my friends or girlfriends or enemies saw me. Tio Juan didn't even notice people. He was totally wrapped up in the work. He showed me exactly how far apart the rows should be and how deep. He couldn't read the words on the seed packets, but he knew from the pictures what the seeds were inside. He poured them into his hand and smiled. He seemed to recognize them like old friends. Watching him carefully sprinkle them into the troughs he'd made, I realized that I didn't know anything about growing food and that he knew everything. I stared at his busy fingers, then his eyes, they were focused, not far away or confused. He changed from a baby back into a man.